experience seminar for the chemistry department. And that uh, just a few announcements. A, I want to thank you all for coming. And that remind you that there is the departmental picnic on Thursday, May 28th at 4.07 p.m. in City Park. If you are interested, please sign up down by the stock room, which is by the elevator. Also want to remind you that this time next week, we have two more talks. Um, Brandon Taylor and Spencer Swick will be kicking things off starting at 3.10 uh, p.m. in this room. And then our very own Cassonia Smith, right over here, is going to be talking on Friday at 3.10 p.m. Not this Friday, but next Friday. I didn't scare you, did I? Okay, <laughs> okay. anyhow, without further ado, uh, we will have the introduction. So it's my honor to introduce you as a Shah uh, from Queens, New York. Um, hey. so so uh, Schneiser comes to us as a chemistry, chemistry double man? I forget. Biochemistry. You're not actually a chemistry, you're a biochemistry major, mm -hmm. and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so she's a biochemistry major. She's done research both in our labs, uh, here under the direction of Dr. Stork, um, and also she's done some work that she's going to talk about today at the University of Cincinnati. I um, mean, this is the kind of chemistry that I like talking about the most because it's materials, it's stuff that all of us chemists and non-chemists have interaction with. We have all held plastic, right? It's a thing that we have some tactile knowledge of. And so we are going to talk special plastics. Today, right? yes. Hello. Um, so today we'll be talking about developing novel shape memory polymers for biomedical applications. And as uh, Professor Debert said, this research was conducted at the University of Cincinnati under Dr. Neil Ayers. So first off, I want to say polymers are everywhere. Yay! Um, we see them in the bulletproof vest that policemen use to protect themselves from bullets, in the plastic bottles that we use to hold our beverages, in the clothing that we wear, and also in our DNA. These three here are examples of synthetic polymers, whereas DNA in the, is an example of an organic polymer. And so, if you, if you notice, our DNA is in bulletproof mathers, our clothing, or the plastic bottles that hold our beverages. And that's because of the <coughs> properties, um, <coughs> excuse me, that's because of the chemical composition of the, of the polymer that allows it to exhibit certain properties. And those properties are, for example, Kevlar's bulletproof, Plastic bottles are fairly durable, but still somewhat very flexible. And our clothing is um, really flexible and our DNA is hosted within our body. So what is a polymer? So polymer is a giant molecule that consists of smaller repeating units. And here I'll give you an example of this little ball here representing a monomer. And what we're gonna do is take these two monomers, we're gonna react them together and then form a polymer chain. So what makes the polymer special is the monomers, and what makes the monomer special is the reactive sites, chain length, and the intermolecular forces. And I'm gonna be talking about these as we go along. So let's talk about the reactive sites. So the reactive sites are areas on the monomers where other molecules can bind. So here we have an example of this reaction where this functional group here is going to be added on to this um, functional group here and that's going to create a very long chain and as we see here this is these brackets here with this little n represents the repeating unit and what you need to know from this slide is that the functional groups regulate the chain length so guess what we're going to talk about next chain length um, <laughs> And so chain length is just the size of the polymer. So here I've given you an example of ethane. It's not a polymer, it's a gaseous compound. It's a two carbon molecule. And it's, as you can see, it's able to move really uh, freely. But if we were to add um, more carbons, which is denoted by these little green balls, in the example of butane, we'll, we'll see that these longer chains occupy more space and as a result cannot move as freely. So what that means is the big, the, excuse me, the more carbons or the bigger the polymer, the heavier the chain. And finally, we're gonna talk about the intermolecular forces. So intermolecular forces are the attraction or repulsion between neighboring atoms or ions or molecules. And here we're gonna be talking about hydrogen bonding and London dispersion forces, but there are more intermolecular forces that we're going, that, excuse me, that I'm not going to address in this talk. So here give me an example of water, <coughs> let's drink some. Um, 
This is oxygen and these two little blue balls are hydrogen. And here oxygen possesses a lone pair of electrons whereas the hydrogen is positive and they f they attract one another because opposites attract and you're going to see this little dashed line which represents the hydrogen bond. L London dispersion forces occur between two non-polar molecules, so something that's pretty much carbon-based, and it results from the uneven distribution of electrons. And we see that in the example of graphite sheets, and graphite is in our pencils, and if you really think about it, when you're writing, it's fairly easy to write with a pencil. It comes off really easy, and that's because of the weak interaction of the London dispersion forces. So now that we've talked about intermolecular forces, chain length, we talked about reactive sites and the monomer itself, we can now address like, why isn't our DNA bulletproof? So let's talk about that. As you can see here, both Kevlar and DNA both possess hydrogen bonding, which is a very strong bond. Denoted here by this little green squiggly line and here by these little dashed lines. As you can see, Kevlar has these nitrogen groups. They also have a carbonyl, which is the C double bonded, double bonded to the oxygen and it also possesses rings. DNA, on the other hand, possesses these sugar groups, which is this orange pentagon, and then it has these phosphate group, which is the green ball, and then we have the nucleotide bases, which is A, T, C, and G. And so, as you can see here, Kevlar has this rod shape, and we can think of it as like a pencil, whereas DNA is more shaped like a coral. It's double, um, it's um, a double, stranded um, molecule, so it's gonna wrap around one another. And so the reason why Kevlar is, is bulletproof is because of its stacking. And what that means is that we have these rods that are being held together by the hydrogen bonding. And so let's, let, I'll give you guys an example. So if we have pencils, and pencils, if you hold them together, are fairly hard to break if you have like 20 of them in your hand. And then if you were to add the hydrogen bonding, which can be the glue, it'll be even harder to break those. So now that we talked about that, we can actually address what I want to talk about for um, what I was doing this entire summer, which is biomaterials and biocompatibility. Although these two things sound similar, I assure you they're not. Biomaterials are four medical devices defined as non-viable materials used in medical devices intended to interact with a biological system. And so, what does that mean? That's really jargony. Well, here we have an example of a pacemaker. I have a pacemaker, in case anybody didn't know. I think they're pretty cool. And um, um, the pacemaker here is the medical um, device, and the biological system would be the heart. So that's the only two that we're actually looking at right now. But when we talk about biocompatibility, which is uh, defined as the ability of a material to perform with an appropriate re host response in a specific application, that pretty much means that we're looking at the polymer coating that is going to be engulfing this, this um, pacemaker, and then we're going to look at how that um, polymer interacts with the body. And what we're trying to see is, is your body going to reject the material or is it going to accept it? When we're thinking about creating this polymer, we want, to we want it to have sugars because our DNA has sugars. We also want it to have reactive monomers. And we also want it to have hydrophobic areas and hydrophilic areas. And so what hy hydrophobic means is that it hates water. An example of that would be silicone, rubber, and PET. PET is polyethylene terephthalate, or it's just a component of plastic bottles like the Dasani water bottles that you guys usually see. Hydrophilicity is some is something that loves water, and we see an example of that um, in polyurethane. And if we want to, get, and if you guys want an example of that, we could think of stents. And stents possess both hydrophobic, hydrophobicity <coughs> and hydrophilicity because it, at some point it does dissolve into your arteries, but it also still maintains its shape. So, which means at some point it is going to have hydrophilic um, areas and hydrophobic areas. So, why do we need to create biocompatible polymers? Well, current biocompatible polymers, such as heparin, which is an anticoagulant, unfortunately, has contaminations and falls short. So there's a need for new synthetic materials. <coughs> and so um, heparin is, or was made from both um, pigs and cows, but in the past few years, 
um, with the mad cow's disease that happened. Now, hep, hep, excuse me, now heparin is exclusively made from pigs and that causes religious implications. I'm a Muslim, I have a pacemaker. I wouldn't want something that's made of pork to be inside of me. So if I were to, cre so if I were to create a material that is synthetic, I'd want it to not sort of go against my religion. And with the synthetic materials, we'll be able to sort of build in certain properties that can alter the structure. Characteristics of this biocompatible polymer should be something that's non-degradable yet flexible. What that means is that you don't want chemicals leaching into your body. I don't know about you guys, but I don't want reactive species all over the place. I don't want to die. So, um, I want something flexible. I don't want something that is um, going to be very um, hard in my body and it's going to poke me somewhere. Like if you have a stent in your, in your heart, you don't want something very um, hard poking in your artery. You want it to not coagulate your blood or cause blood clots. You want it to possess shape memory properties and I'll address what that means. And you also want it to have thermal properties that correspond to body temperature. And what that means is that the chain, the temperature, excuse me, so the point at which the polymer goes from its really hard phase to its sort of rubbery phase, you want that transition to correspond to body, temp body temperature, which is 38 degrees Celsius. So what are shape memory polymers? Well, it's a synthetic material capable of conforming to a deformed shape and then returning to its original configuration given a certain stimulus. And in this case, the temperature change, excuse me, in this case, it would be a temperature change. So here I've given an example of a microactuator. And what that pretty much means is that this device is just gonna be inserted into, bo in, into the body and it's gonna pretty much pull out a blood clot. It's, non, it's not that invasive and it's a pretty sweet technique. It's still um, in the testing phase. And so this um, device has a um, shape memory polymer coating, and it also has a shape memory, shape memory polymer um, with a nickel alloy inside that's connected to a copper wire. And so before it's put into the body, it's shaped like a rod, and then the copper wire gives it a current. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna make a slight incision where the um, hemorrhaging tissue is located, make that cut, push the the microactuator inside, and then when we heat up the shape memory polymer, um, the shape memory polymer is going to expand, and because it's such a confined space, it's going to start of co start coiling, and as a result, it's going to start pulling out the hemorrhaging tissue. And so now, with um, the research that I've been doing, we want to make a shape memory polymer that has a glass transition temperature that corresponds to body temperature. And so what does glass tra transition temperature mean? It's a really scary term, but I show you it's not. And so the glass transition temperature is a reversible transition where a polymer changes from a hard and, hard and relatively brittle state, as seen here. It's glassy, so we have an example of this, which would be below its TG to a rubbery light state, which could be seen here from my hair tie, which is more rubbery, as you can see here. And as it goes through the temperature corresponding to the ch transition, which is the glass transition temperature, we go from something more crystalline and hard to rubbery. And if you were to take the slope of this line here, you'd get a numerical value that corresponds to the glass transition temperature. So how do we make this polymer? Well, Dr. Ayers, and his group used a step growth polymerization, which is a series of steps that allow you to form a high molecular weight polymer through one reaction mechanism. And so what that means is that you're gonna have two difunctional monomers that are gonna be originally reacting. And so what, what, do, what does difunctional mean? Just picture my hand as a monomer. It's gonna have two ends in which, just think of it as sticky and it's gonna grab onto other monomers that are in the quote unquote pot. So as you can see here, we have an example of a monomer that's going to react with each up with um, another monomer and form a dimer and then that dimer is going to react with other monomers and other dimers and then form the polymer chain so essentially it's a big game of snake <laughs> the polymer that we wanted to create is seen here and this is just a little snippet of the large uh, of the there's a larger polymer network but this is just a little snippet of it and so what we did is that we reacted uh, commercially available toluene diisocyanates. What that means is that we went to the store or contacted Sigma Aldridge, asked them, hey, can I have some toluene diisocyanate? Cool, got that. And then what I spent um, the entire summer synthesizing was the um, 
glucose modified dynamine as seen here. So going back to what we were talking about with the biocompatibility, as you can see, we've got sugars checked, so that helps with biocompatibility. We also have this poly, poly, excuse me, this urea group, which is found in urine. So again, biocompatibility. And here, as you can see, this re resembles Kevlar, so that adds to the robustness of the polymer. So how does the polymer look as a whole? Well, it looks like a fishnet pretty much. And the way in which we get it to look like a fishnet is through cross-linking, which is where we're gonna be using covalent bonds to link the polymer chains together. And we link the polymer chains through a process called vulcanization. And what that pretty much is that we're gonna be using sulfur to bridge the polymer chains together. So we prepared the monomer by taking glucose and then pretty much capping all the hydroxyl groups, which are OHs. And then we, we get this um, compound right here. And then we selectively decapped this particular um, functional group here, which is um, the anomeric carbon and it's denoted by the squeaky line. And now it's reactive and we can add a really good leaving group onto it. And from there, we, we exchange that for another group which sets up the reaction for the addition of the dienine. So essentially what we're doing here is just pretty much going through a series of um, substitution reactions in order to get to this stage here where we have um, all the other hydroxyl groups protected. And then we're going to leave this particular area here where it's gonna be reactive for, again, the addition of the, di the dienine. So we're gonna take, so when we add the dynamine, as you can see here, it has this group NS, which is nitrobenzyl sulfonyl. And so that's a pretty much a giant protecting group. And so when we take that off, now we have our dynamine. And so now we can make our polymer because now it's reactive. So how do we know we've made what we've made? Well, we're gonna be using a technique called H1 NMR. And so, um, NMR is a technique used to determine the purity and the molecular structure of a compound of interest. So here it's a, the glucose modified diamine. And so what we're gonna do is that we're gonna identify the different environments of the hydrogen atoms. And the way we're gonna do that is by, the NMR is a giant magnet and the hydrogen atoms are gonna act as little magnets. And when they're next to each other, it's going, the, the NMR is essentially gonna make the hydrogen atoms move relative to one another. An example of that would be here, and it's show, shown with ethanol, which is denoted by CH3, CH2OH. And the hydrogen um, on the OH is pretty um, downfield compared to the other two, and that's because the oxygen is really hungry for electrons. And so it's gonna strip it away, and as a result, the hydrogen is gonna be more downfield. The CH2, which is um, still fairly close to the oxygen, also feels that sort of pull for electrons, and so that's also going to be downfield. The um, CH3, on the other hand, does not feel um, the pull of electrons, and as a result, it's going to be more upfield. Um, uh, hydrogen is denoted by H, oxygen is denoted by O, and carbon is denoted by C. So the structure that I um, that I made is as follows, and what this is pretty much telling us is that um, we see the NS right here because it has uh, nit nitrobenzyl sulfonyl has a ring, and so the ring um, usually shows up on an NMR between seven and eight. So that so that means yes, we have the nitrobenzyl sulfonyl. Also, we know that our um, glucose is still protected by the appearance of these peaks here, which um, represent anywhere between 24 to 27 mm -hmm. hydrogens, so that's good. And then finally, we also see peaks here, which correspond to the hydrogens along the chain and on the glucose molecule. And so we also took an NMR of the deprotected um, glucose modified diamine. And so you see that, yay, the peaks are gone. And now we see a peak here at around 2.7, which corresponds to the diamine peaks, but we also see um, the hydrogens of the acetyl groups, again, 24 to 27, and then we still see the peaks that correspond to the chain and to the glucose molecule. 
So now we've actually confirmed that we've made the structure. So now what we need to do is pretty much react the monomer with the commercially available other monomer. And we're gonna do that in a one-to-one -one ratio. And then what we're gonna do is try and evaluate the glass transition temperature. So the way in which we do that is by using differential scaling calorimetry. And so what this does is that we're gonna have two pans. A reference pan, which has nothing, and a sample pan, which has our polymer. And so we're gonna heat both of these pans. And I don't know if you guys will get, guess this, but if you heat this pan, it has nothing inside of it, temperature is just gonna skyrocket pretty quickly. However, this one, it has a polymer inside of it, and so it's, this pan is going to absorb, needs to absorb more heat in order to be at the same rate as, as this um, pan here. And so the goal is to keep both of these pans at the same rate. And so what a DSC does is measure the difference between the heat absorbed of the two pans. And so what I want you guys to get appreciation for is DSC and the um, uh, difference between a DSC and a calorimeter. Here, what we're doing, as I said, we're measuring the difference between the heat absorbed by the sample pan and the reference pan, whereas a calorimeter is just um, identifying the heat capacity of the chemical reactions. Um, both of these do measure heat capacity in some regard. Um, the DSC, it breaks into molecular forces, but it doesn't break um, bonds or covalent bonds like a calorimeter does. So a calorimeter pretty much, depending on what you're using, blows stuff up. We're not trying to blow stuff up here. <coughs> and so we did DSC on the pr protected shape memory polymer. And uh, I've been using that term throughout the talk and I'm gonna explain what protected means. So here protected is the acetyl groups. And so I'm gonna give you guys an example of sugar. So here we have regular table sugar. What we're gonna do is add some heat to it and then we're gonna observe what happens. And what do we get? Ooh, caramel, yum. <laughs> And if we were to acetylate the glucose, glucose is sugar, we would get this molecule here, and if we add heat to it, we'll see that nothing really happens. It's gonna take a longer time for this to melt. So now let's turn our attention back to the protected shape memory polymer. So here we're plotting the um, milliwatts um, over milligrams of the polymer that we used um, <coughs> against the increasing temperature. So we started off by um, freezing the polymer and then slowly watch it, watch it um, go through the, uh, its transition until it finally hits its glass transition temperature. And as we can see, the glass transition temperature is 56.9, excuse me, 56.7 degrees Celsius. So let's think back to the, the um, body, body temperature, which is 38 degrees Celsius. So 38 degrees Celsius is here, and then that 56.7 degrees Celsius is here. So that means that in the body, this would actually be quite hard and you, we really wouldn't want that. So this here just serves as an example for, um, or it just tells us that the heavier the polymer, the higher the glass transition temperature. We also did the deep protective polymer or shape memory polymer and that's denoted <coughs> by the hydroxyl groups as opposed to the acetyl groups. And so the deep protected um, polymer indicated a glass transition temperature of 29.1 degrees Celsius. And so what the DSC is pretty much telling us, as I said, the, um, we're breaking into molecular forces. And although our polymer is cross-linked, so it has covalent bonds, which is holding it together, you're gonna have the intermolecular forces are gonna be broken. So as a result, the um, polymer chains are gonna be able to move more freely. And as it's moving more freely, it's, um, you're gonna see the polymer transition to a more rubbery phase. So, what have we learned from all of this? Well, the molecular weight of the monomer affects the glass transition temperature. If we increase the temperature, it dissipates the intermolecular forces and the polymer chains have more elbow room, thus we get the rubbery phase. The deep protected polymer has a glass transition temperature of 29 degrees Celsius. I mean, that's relatively close to physiological temperatures. I mean, compared to the 56 degrees Celsius, I don't think anybody wants that in their body. And finally, because um, different ratios of the monomer alter the thermal properties or the glass transition temperature. So in the future, what we can do to improve this experiment is that we can uh, target physiological temperatures by altering the ratios of the diamine to the toluene diisocyanate. So instead of using 
a one to one ratio. Maybe we can do one to 0.5 or maybe one to three. We can also assess the shape memory behavior by testing the flexibility and the strength. And finally, we can assess the biocompatibility of the shape memory polymers. So maybe at some point we can probably put in some cell lines and see how it reacts. Um, I'd like to thank the NSF for uh, funding this experiment, the chemistry department at the University of Cincinnati, Dr. goodman Starter, Dr. Alt, Dr. Ayers especially, for um, hosting me and allowing me to work on his um, experiments, Chin Yuen, uh, chemistry department at Lawrence University, Dr. Hall, Dr. Deborah, and Dr. Stork. Any questions? So how close are you to making bulletproof DNA? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the thing you're creating, the thing this polymer is ultimately meant to do, is that supposed to have a variety of applications to a variety of different things, or is this something that has a specific use, like you would build this thing into that clock? So just think of this as the, it's, what we're trying to make is a polymer that's biocompatible, so that means it has applications everywhere. So it can be used as a stent, it can be used for a pacemaker, it can be used in the, um, the microactuator that I gave. It doesn't really have to have one specific use. Because as I said, like the current biocompatible polymers like heparin, it, it needs improving. Yeah. The H1 NMR, um, yeah. is there a device that does that or did you guys open the... Oh, um, it's a, it's a, it's a device. Mm -hmm. It's like a giant magnet. I mean, I can't really go. I don't really know how it looks. It's like a giant cylindrical okay. thing. Yeah. Is it like an expensive sort of like yeah. test? To okay. <laughs> it's expensive. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not an expensive test to run. It's just that the equipment itself is expensive. Yeah. We have one downstairs. Oh. Yeah, Erica. So, um, well, when I say glass, I'm meaning something that's hard. So let's think of my yeah. bottle here. This is pretty hard. And if I were to put a flame to it, it'll get more like pliable. Right. So I can bend it. And it, that would be an example of like something more rubbery. Yeah. Um, are you talking about? So like there's crystalline. So are you talking about the second phase of crystal, like the second, the second time it goes into its crystalline phase? Because there's like the first time and then there's a second time. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, and I know those look kind of like dips on um, mm -hmm. differential scanning powder. Did you see any of those or were they at like temperature ranges that were like totally irrelevant? To I guess we weren't really looking for those because you wouldn't really want to hit something that's going to go back to be like hard in your body. Yeah. Like the main goal was to make sure that it's pretty much rubbery and flexible. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're looking for at the point at which it gets there. Okay. So we're not really looking for it to like go back to being hard. I don't think it's a huge worry in polymer chemistry. Huh? It's not a huge worry. I don't think in polymer chemistry. Like oh. Some materials it might be good for yeah. polymer. It's, it's just basically this middle ground between glass like and like. Yeah. Yeah. So when um, I'm following that you're seeing that 55 or 56.7 um, Celsius is your glass composition temperature, but on your second plot, you claim is 29.1. Mm -hmm. Is it 29.1? Well, I don't even really see. Oh, it's like a little bit. The end. Yeah. Um, so how, how reproducible is this data to be? It doesn't look like it's much. There is hard. Um, so we could only get, so when we were doing this, the instrument itself was giving us a bit of Bit better problems because of like I don't know there's some, yeah it's just for some reason it was really hot and that was messing with our data and so um, I trusted my grad student with with what she saw because she's the one getting the PhD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I'm so I'm actually reproducing her her data so okay. she's going to be using what I've done and sort of trying to create like the 
the she's gonna cross link it together like she did she did all of that and this is reproducible yeah it is it's most of this is already published already uh from when you made this polymer how much would you get how much of it would you get <laughs> it was so much better than organic chemistry where you get such little yields. I was so happy about my life. <laughs> I got like, I don't know, the we got like a 60 something, we got a 60% yield with this. And I was like, oh my God. Can you hold it? I'm like, yeah, you can hold it and play with it. I was I doing that. I mean, should I wear gloves? It's kind of nasty. I mean, okay, so, um, we, so we got uh, a good bit of it. And so we melted it, and it was a good amount where you can actually physically see like the, it looked, it looked like caramel pretty much, and you can actually see it in like a little disc. It was a good amount of yield. I mean, we started off, I started off with about 10 grams, and in the end I got maybe about two or three grams, somewhere along those lines, which is not bad. Yeah, yeah. You said chain length is important. How do you know how many things are in the chain? Um, that's a really good question. How do we know about how many things are in the chain? I guess with the reaction that we're going to be using, like that, they use raft, although we use separate polymerization, and that allows us to sort of um, add polymers, um, add the monomers through a radical um, reaction, and I guess that dictates how much of the monomer we can add. And so I didn't specifically ask how many, um, how big is it going to be. But um, I know that that raft helps us. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a really well controlled way. To yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is the glass transition to the process reversible in these, or the way to decompose? Um, you could go back if you were to freeze it. Yeah. 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 Back to Stephen's question. So, how? What's the the length difference between the heat protected and the other one that has a higher the acetyl groups. Shouldn't, no, shouldn't be any. Length, oh, lengthwise there shouldn't be any. Oh no, there shouldn't be any. Okay, so there's no The only difference between them is that one is protective, which is the acetyl groups, okay, so and one isn't. Yeah. Like other weights there. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So, your last slide you said like, oh, we can play at different ratios and see, see what that does. Mm -hmm. What would that do? Right? So let's say you <coughs> added, you know, you're doing like one to one, right? Mm -hmm. These two things, and you add like three to one, how do you expect anything to be different? I feel like if you did three to one, that might give you a higher glass transition temperature. I would personally, I would think of doing like one to one and a half. I don't think anything will be different. Because if you think about your reagents, you've kind of got like AA and BB, mm -hmm. right? So they can only react in one way. Okay. Right? It's not like you can go like AA, BB, 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 right? So they have to alternate. Right. Right? So it's kind of like if you have to have an alternating, I'm not sure we're having an excess. Do you mean, are you talking about like a copolymer, which is like... Right, so you're doing, yeah, you're doing copolymerization. Right. So you've got two different monomers that have to alternate. Right. A, B, A, B, A, B. Mm -hmm. So they have to alternate, and it's, if you have excess of one, it's not really going to matter, except at the end of the day, you're going to Okay, that makes sense. All right. I'll probably have to ask Dr. Ayers. I'm going to get back to you. Any more questions? All right, thank you for speaking with me.